with the fraternities and the sororities. What does law enforcement know? And what what is Brian Koberger's true role here, if any? As always, if you find the Mind Shock podcast interesting and informative, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. You could also be a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Help support the channel that way. Like and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast, or requests. You could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. Okay, if you haven't checked out the previous episodes, make sure you check them out. I'm going to be building a lot off of that. But this is a very perplexing case, because a lot of the early information coming out circulated around one if not two of the other roommates. There's actually a sixth roommate known as A.C. And she's a very, very curious individual. Again, I do not claim anything is true or untrue. I do not claim anyone is innocent or guilty. But many believe that she knows quite a bit the sororities and the fraternities know quite a bit. Now, AC apparently wasn't staying at the house at that time, but she was still paying rent. And AC was supposedly Madison's BFF until recently where something happened, some kind of split, some kind of something, and that potentially caused some more issues. Now, Again, these are college kids, so it's not that any of this means that any of them are directly involved in murder in any way, but it also means it's kind of very difficult to separate potential issues between them and if it led someone or someones to snap, or if there's simply something else going on regarding drug or criminality on that campus and in that area. And I've been able to dig up some early social media posts right around the times of the murder and what other neighbors thought and commented on social media. Not in On Harsh, you could check out the previous episode for that individual. But there were other neighbors, and and one of them did speak out, apparently, and we'll be getting to all that. But first, to set the stage here, we're going to look at a video from True Crime Design. They have a very interesting video, Idaho 4, Recruited, Exploited, Silenced. It's a very interesting video from the channel True Crime Design. The description of the video here, drug trafficking and human trafficking often go hand in hand. Does the shadowy syndicate that seems to control the community of Moscow run deeper than we thought? Question mark. And, yeah, we're going to be dissecting this video to set the stage, and then we'll be looking at other information, including comments made on social media directly in the aftermath. Because, I mean, regardless of what happened, there just seems to be a lot more going on. There's drug overlap other criminality overlap, and possibly some level of human trafficking overlap, which I think no one will be surprised by. 
even if it didn't directly relate to the murders, although it might have. And that's what we'll be, of course, exploring in typical mind shock fashion, attempting not to fall for any of these silly logical fallacies like appeal to incredulity that a lot of coincidence theorist goofs desperately grasp, pretending that if their female minds find something difficult to believe or it seems far-fetched based on their subjective, mentally deficient brains not being able to grasp it, that somehow that that would mean it's untrue. Obviously, the truth is whatever it is. And if you're not being objective and logical, it's gonna be difficult to get to it. So, obviously, trafficking doesn't mean that they were kidnapped against their will and taken somewhere. There's varying degrees here, and the True Crime Design channel with this particular video actually did a very good job at dissecting all of that. So, let's get into that. Okay. Parents, ask your children what they know if your kids are over there. They know something. If these kids stand together, we can put an end to this. Otherwise, kids are going to keep dying. The people are going to keep dying. These people mean it. They're not kidding. They're dangerous. This isn't just one crime. And the police officer did say it was parallel crimes. That's, oh, I'm glad you said that again. So you that said parallel good. crimes last parallel night. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dago, were you going to say something? I was just getting ready to say, I think everybody's thinking the same the thing. The same thing? Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't to clarify that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple other people did. So if you want to go into that, Kim, whatever you can with that, that would be I, I will go into the one of the, I will not go into one one side of it, but I will go into well, the hold on one second. Are you talking about parallel investigations? Because I know last yeah. night you had said the FBI were already there, blah, blah, blah. You know, there. what happened on the night of, you know, November 13th kind of interfered yeah. with something yeah. else they already had going on. And so... That's quite mind-shocking there right off the bat. So, it's this weird pattern. I mean, look at the Delphi murders. I mean, some of these other cases, apparently the FBI was already on the ground investigating something else when this happened. I mean, in the previous episode, we actually went over that there was at least one police cruiser literally dozens of feet from the home with an earshot of screams and it was just parked there for what i mean is this all by design what is really going on here dustin in the chat here the top brass of moscow is all retiring their insistence on in pushing a lone killer has painted them into a corner this was a team not one person i mean just basic logic would lean in that direction i mean that is true and again for those that don't know apparently this image on the screen that i have up it's from some kind of halloween thing of a slasher party i mean there were social media posts with sororities regarding slashing or whatever i mean was this all some kind of sick joke taken way too far and by how many people because there are all these animal killings going on there's drug dealings there's all these mysterious deaths that are written off as drug overdoses or suicides and maybe some of them were but are we going to fall for these uh, false dichotomies saying either all of them were or none of them were i mean how would we know it just seems really shady and obviously it seems like actual investigation wasn't really done in order to not paint it as a crime because if it was a murder obviously it looks better for the town for the university if they write it off as some kind of accidental death or overdose because if it really was a murder i mean there was what 10 deaths in the previous year or two i mean that's kind of a lot none of them were classified as murder there were ods suicides accidental death classifications but how many of them truly were those things I mean, was one or two of them at least a murder? Maybe, we don't know. So, what is the FBI investigating here if this information is accurate? That there were so-called parallel investigations, some of which were going on before the quadruple homicide? 
What is going on in Moscow? For the people who don't listen to the Mind Shock Jean Benet Ramsey series, check it out. Moscow, Idaho, specifically mentioned years and years ago as some kind of corridor for some kind of satanic human trafficking. I mean, it's really wild. I mean, it's going back years and years. I've never heard of Moscow, Idaho until the Idaho homicides, but apparently it, it, it came up in the Jean Benet Ramsey case in connection to satanic human trafficking and child abuse. I mean, just really crazy and insane. Sham here and why tear down the house so soon? Yeah, good question. Some people speculate that drugs were hidden in the walls and the ceiling, etc., and it could implicate a lot of people if there's vast corruption, etc. It may or may not directly relate to the homicides, but they wanted to cover it all up because, yeah, otherwise, I mean, their house is still standing for murders that took place decades and decades ago. I mean, there are some old, I mean, is the Lizzie Borden house still standing? I mean, their house is standing a hundred years ago from murders. And yet they tore this down before the trial. They couldn't keep it up for just one or two more years. Very weird. Very weird. I don't know who's hallucinating. That's not weird. Because if there is a vast conspiracy and they're trying to cover it up, obviously they would want to get rid of that house. I had asked in chat, was it FBI and say DEA? You know, we're already like on the ground and, you know, had an operation going. And then, you know, 1122, that happening just kind right. of like blew up everything. It was, yeah. It's a special, say, task I will say, a special task force. I will say, you go any further with that, I'm going to say, and nobody's going to pressure her. There is one specific investigation she's not going to talk about. I already know what it's about and it's going to be left alone. And if nobody likes that, you're going to have to deal with it because I will not allow her to talk about it on my channel right. for her own well being. And she doesn't want to do it anyway. So that's where we're going to go right. here on out. Once again, my apologies. Go ahead and continue. I'm sorry. So he's going out of his way to state that there's an investigation that he's not going to mention. And that nobody wants to talk about. I actually don't know what he's referring to. But that is curious. Apparently there were at least one drug investigation. So FBI and possibly also DEA. Now here, this also reminds me of the Moore Murray case of all cases. So for those that don't know, Maura Murray's vehicle, I mean, she might never have left UMass, but the official narrative goes that she left UMass car found abandoned in this small ham hamlet of Haverhill, New Hampshire. Now, coincidentally, there's DEA and U.S. martial activity in the area where this random student supposedly has a DUI walk away. Glitched here... Dago is a fed. Okay. So he has some kind of inside knowledge of uh, of an investigation in Moscow prior to the murders. So there's an FBI and possibly DEA investigation going on. Now, the other thing that's kind of weird... The other thing that's kind of weird is... Again, the coincidence theorist, they love this stuff. But the, the sororities that the victims belonged to were the only ones on probation and investigation by whatever oversight of the national sororities or whatever. So the two that they belong to, I think there's 10 on campus, so the two that they belong to, they're the only two out of the ten. So the other eight that they didn't belong to, apparently they're not on probation, no investigations. But the two that the victims belong to, they just so happen to be one, the ones that are on probation and investigation. Now the other thing that, again, rumor mill, were they kicked out of the sororities or did they leave shortly before the murders? I've seen a lot of speculation on that. I, I don't have definitive sources. I don't know if there are definitive sources on that. Glitch says, it goes deep. Yeah, it definitely does. It definitely does. I mean, th this is truly a bizarre case. I mean, nothing really lines up here. So they're trying to show, so it's a, they're, so it's a they're drug task force. It's a quad... He's called the Quad Four, and it's in different areas, and they've brought Moscow into it recently. They've been there since about 2015. They have been working on this drug problem, and it's a crisis, actually, over there. And I 
believe that. I do believe that. Okay, hold on a second. So the coincidence theory is to say that drugs had nothing to do with this. That's kind of a weird thing to say, because how would you know? So clearly, it appears that this area, I mean, it necessitates a specific task force. Now, that's kind of weird. If this really is just a small town, because a lot of universities have some kind of small drug use. I mean, you would could say almost all of them do. But how many towns have specific drug task forces dedicated to them because the drug problem is so bad? I mean, in the middle of nowhere, not that many. I mean, not that many. On screen here, in 2022, the Quad Cities Task Force was responsible for 69 drug cases and 60 arrests. In addition, the task force efforts resulted in a seizure of 17.55 grams of heroin, 371.97 grams of methamphetamine, 170.1 grams of cocaine, and 6,289 fentanyl pills. I mean, that's not crazy numbers but that's not nothing that's not i mean that's that that's clearly a problematic number it's not a one-off little here and there you know just a couple of dealers i mean there's that does seem like a a serious enough problem that would necessitate these task forces so to hallucinate and pretend that there's zero chance that a house known as a party house known and admitted as a party house that there might not be some kind of overlapping criminal situation with drugs. I mean, coincidence theorists are a weird bunch. I mean, they're hallucinating that there's no chance that there could be an overlap. That's a weird hallucination. I don't know. The um, the children were harmed because they knew something, and it was a notice, put everybody else on notice to shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Tailgating tickets, those, I've never heard of them. Those are about, we're watching you. Noise complaints, we're listening. Keep your mouth shut. That's what that is. That's what I truly and firmly believe these were. This that happened here. That's what this is. I mean, this is really creepy. So she's insinuating here that these traffic violations, noise complaints, etc. Is this some kind of police corruption warning these people without outright saying it? I don't know. I actually don't know. I suppose it's plausible that it isn't, but again, let's not fall for false dichotomies. Maybe one or two of the situations were, and other ones weren't. I don't know, but it's kind of creepy. It is kind of creepy if they really were. Glitch says, confidential informants are pressed to do things way more than what they got busted for. Yeah, that's unfortunate is it is a reality and and some CIs end up dead again Erickson Akori of UMass famous case again the in the Maura Murray case I mean yeah I mean there's precedent for CIs getting killed literally getting killed so to again hallucinate and pretend that there's zero chance that that happened here again that doesn't mean all of them that were CIs maybe one of them were and again, when people are getting drunk or high, they they might have looser lips than they otherwise would have had. I mean, is that what Maddie meant when she says, I told Adam everything? Everything about what? And again, we're talking about college kids here. We're talking about college kids that these are not full-grown adults that have all of this life experience, I mean, a lot of times, unfortunately, I mean, even in situations where there are no crimes, I mean, teenagers and, you know, people in their early 20s, sometimes they trust the wrong people. They think people are truly their friends that are not. And this gets exploited and taken advantage of. And unfortunately, in certain situations, it could end up in a murder situation. People might not realize the danger that they're in. I mean, literally almost every CI, particularly in the past. See, this is a little strange because this is a very recent case. This is totally modern, post-internet. But again, when you're in certain circles, you don't have that objective viewpoint from the outside looking in. So when you're already in the circle, if you have friends who have dealers or whatever, if it's an everyday thing the level of danger might not be clearly apparent to someone inside that bubble. 
Now, from us, outside looking in, it's like, okay, this is all very, very dangerous, but to someone living this day in, day out, in a bubble, it might not appear as dangerous as it truly is. And um, I believe they're very close to Salvi where they were, and it blew it out of the water. And that's what I really believe happened. And I, and there's many legs to it, right? If you think about how many people were over there. I called the FBI and they were there. What do you believe the motive of the crime was? To shut them up. I believe that the, it was initiated to shut them up, and I believe maybe the people who were, were hired to do it or told to do it um, went overboard. So I'm not sure what she means by go overboard, shut them up. Were they supposed to just intimidate them or beat them up? Or were they supposed to kill them, but only one or two of them and not in that fashion in any way? It was supposed to be quick or whatever. But this was just such a butcher fest, supposedly, as reported, that people are starting to think it's some crazy serial killer. But, yeah, this this is tough. Hello, Cassidy. Welcome. Yeah, th this is truly a mind-shocking case. I mean, and with all these layers to it, I still can't get over how there's a cop car literally a few dozen feet from the house while this is going on. Now, the dark theory would be that the cop car was there to make sure things got done that night. Yeah, I mean, that's a dark theory. Again, I don't claim anything is true or untrue. This is Mind Shock, where the motto, of course, is the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. Transnational drug traffickers and criminal organizations often look to increase profits and market control through diversification. This means using trafficking routes for drugs, labor, sex, and violence. And again, just real quick, is there anybody that actually doesn't know this? It's kind of like mafias. They, they deal in a lot of different types of crime. It's really not that, I mean, it's just, it's really not that hard to believe that Criminal scum are involved in different types of criminal enterprises. Again, not rocket science, but for whatever reason, the coincidence there is have trouble with this. Human trafficking, and particularly child trafficking, underlies every other great crime in this country. Children are now more valuable than drugs for criminal uh, transactions. Wow. 271% increase in human trafficking in Idaho in 2022. That is astounding. The source here, the Uniform Crime Report. That is absolutely astounding. That is a gigantic increase. Now, I know a lot of people did move to Idaho post-COVID, so I'm not sure if that relates to that. But again, I still can't get over... I can't get over that Moscow, Idaho was specifically mentioned in connection with the Judge Long confessions in the Jean Benet Ramsey case going back a number of years before this. Glitch says Idaho is corrupt as all get out. You know, when it comes down to it, I mean, how many states really aren't, though? I mean, there's cases like this in almost every state. Is there something specific that's making you say that, Glitch? Are you from Idaho? If you want to say, if not, that's fine. Do you have some kind of inside knowledge on Idaho? I always thought Idaho was, was pretty chill, laid back. Um, they got a lot of mountains. Uh, I think they have a ski resort, right? Obviously, they grow a lot of potato. I mean, it's a big state with a lot of different... I mean, there's a lot of different type of terrain in that state. There's the vacation area, Coeur d'Alene area. There's all this backcountry that's pretty popular for, I think, snowmobiling and skiing, maybe. And then, of course, there's the farming areas. And then Boise, I think that's the only major city. And then there's a lot of flatland area. There's a lot of parks. I mean, it seems like it's a very diverse state. Not a lot of population, or at least pre-COVID, there wasn't. Glitch says, just a lot of cases that go unsolved. I mean, that's every state, though, isn't it? I mean, there's so many unsolved cases everywhere. But that is an astounding increase. I wonder if that was one of the top increases in the entire country.
today. Children will work overnight shifts at slaughterhouses, factories, restaurants to pay their debts to smugglers and traffickers. Today, children will be sold for sex. Today, children will call a hotline to report they are being abused, neglected, and trafficked. And we don't know if they're gonna get the help they need. We, we, we missed out on a, a really smart person that was going to um, be a little conservative. She was conservative too. She was always looking up stories on child, you know, getting trafficked in. She was telling me that she thinks it's a lot bigger than, than people understand. That's an interesting statement. Not that, you know, not that there aren't any other college students that are researching that or becoming aware of, of various criminal problems in the world. But to write it off and say that it's 100% not related here. And then, of course, the supposedly Kaylee wasn't even supposed to go back that weekend. And apparently there was some kind of reason or hesitation. And the other thing that I really wanted to touch upon that I, I think a lot of people will understand, too. Sometimes in, in some of these cases that happen at universities, high school, whatever, there's a, there's a certain element that's involved in criminality. And if there ends up being a murder or murders that connects to that group, there are so many students that would be completely oblivious to this. I mean, there's probably so many, possibly the vast majority of students at not, not just Idaho University, but all universities, are good, wholesome kids that have nothing to do with this. I mean, maybe they get some drugs here and there once in a while, but they're not directly involved in any kind of major violent crime trafficking or selling of drugs. Maybe they buy here and there or just get it from friends. Obviously, not 100% of college students are drug users either. I mean, there's a middle group that are, but they're not directly involved in any of this kind of crime. So to the people that think... You know, or they want to look at the University of Idaho. I, I didn't go to the University of Idaho, but I'm just saying pretty much every university is going to have probably a majority of just good kids that are not involved in crime. And that's why this is so shocking. People want to just trash University of Idaho, which maybe they should some of the leadership or some security measures. Maybe they should. But in terms of painting all the students under this one negative light, I mean, that's weird to me. And I've seen that done, not just in this case, but other cases. The vast majority of college students are just good, wholesome people. They want to, yeah, maybe they want to have fun, but they're not out there to kill anybody. They don't have direct knowledge of their friends murdering people. I mean, we're talking about the such a small fraction of total college students here. And I just wanted to reiterate that because I think some of that gets lost where people start just saying, oh, University of Idaho is such a terrible place. The frats and the sororities, they're all murderers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's probably a decent amount of bad actors among them. But to say that most of them or all of them are like this, I mean, that's just weird. I don't know why people do that. That's a hasty generalization logic fallacy, of course. Shan says frats and sororities are 100% part of the beast system. Yes, but I would still say the majority of people that go through them, I've known plenty of people in frats and sororities. I would say the majority of them make it through that beast system without being completely corrupted and turned into murderers or criminal scum. Now, there are shady things that go on for sure, like with hazing and just negative issues. But I've known plenty of people that came out just as kind as when they went in. So I wouldn't say that 100% of the bad, and, but that's not to say that I would ever recommend for anybody to join a fraternity or a sorority unless it was maybe some kind of extremely small school that was vetted and people just knew their family went there and they just have some kind of direct knowledge that it's all above board. So, yeah, I mean, there are those issues, of course. Glitch says, three North Carolina frats were busted for dealing millions of dollars of drugs. Chapel Hill, the president of the college, was involved. Wow, that's bonkers. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that's wild. I think Whitey Bulger's brother, was he the chancellor of 
UMass when they had some of the largest drug busts. I don't know, that was wild too. Yeah, no, there's definitely shady business going on. All I'm saying is that I would still say the majority of kids in frats and sororities across the majority of universities are not directly involved in any kind of violent crime. I wouldn't say 100% of them are involved in dealing either. It seems like it's I it seems like in certain universities it just gets a little out of control. University of Idaho might have been one of those, but are all of their frats and sororities out of control? Because again, two of the sororities are on probation. What about the other eight? Are they relatively legit? Or most of the other eight? Glitch says I grew up in a college town. Yeah, I mean there's always a circle of those people. But I wouldn't paint the entire frat or sorority because it's almost like with serial killers. Like, they're, even some of their family members might not even have known that they were a serial killer. So, um, you know, in, in direct proximity to some of these criminals, that doesn't mean people are in the know. There's, I'm sure there's plenty of kind-hearted people in all of these frats and sororities. And probably the majority of students at the, at the University of Idaho are as well. But there does seem to be a circle of bad actors. And it might be a small circle. But it's, you know, obviously there's some kind of a circle. Because there's, there's this drug task force. And here Kaylee's father is saying that she was specifically involved in researching trafficking. Which, yeah, I mean, that's tough. That's tough. It's tough to ignore that. Toward 8 million children a year. In the United States, it's 800,000 to a million. Wow. Right. I actually just saw a post on this on Twitter. I really wanted to address this. Because a lot of coincidence theorists immediately jump to, out of that 800,000, most of them, like 80 to 90 percent, are found. Not so fast. It, these are rolling statistics. Yes, they are found. Most of them are found relatively quickly. Some of them, it takes a year or two. So first of all, you don't know what happened to them in the interim between being found. Second of all, unfortunately, trafficked individuals, both children and adults, not all of them are U.S. citizens. They're coming, they're, they've been, they might have not even been reported missing in their origin country. So by the time they get to the U.S., that's not even included in that statistic of 800 plus thousand going missing. Furthermore, that statistic doesn't include foster runaways that were never reported. It doesn't include, it only includes the reported missing. So a lot of coincidence there's authority worshiping cultists that want to kind of poo poo the 800,000 number. Not so fast because even within that 800,000 number of reported, I mean, that still leaves thousands to tens of thousands that are never found, plus all the ones coming from foreign countries, plus all the ones never reported in the first place. So we're talking tens of thousands minimum. That's what, I mean, one is too much. And a lot of these coincidence theorists goofs want to pretend it's not, it's not enough of a problem simply because a large majority are found after being reported missing. I mean, good that they're found, but... Let's not forget or ignore the tens of thousands that aren't. Or pretend that every single, that only kids that have been reported missing are missing. It's just, yeah, it's weird. Sarah in here, I did too. You grew up in a college town as well. I mean, it seems like, yeah, from everybody I've talked to, over many years, I, I was in academia at one point as well. There's always, I mean, it's like anywhere. There's always a group of so-called bad kids that might engage in this stuff, but that's not the majority of the college. Glitch says the moms had drug charges. Two of the moms were dealing with addiction. Zana's mom was, I know. Megan says, something is up with Daddy Green, in my opinion, and a PD that sure appears corrupt to the core and poorly trained. The power of those factors combined is frightening. Yeah, I mean, again, not to, not to 
go away from Moscow, but this is an issue in many places. I mean, unfortunately, this is a huge issue in many places. Like, people see some of these cases in the media, like the Delphi murders, the Idaho student homicides. They think it's only these towns. I mean, there's countless towns that are also like this, unfortunately. Glitch says, we were raised to not like frat. It's in my blood as a local. Yeah, I mean, frats, yeah, I mean, especially depending on the schools, I mean, a lot of frats can be boisterous and annoying and, and criminal, and criminal, certain group within the frat, not necessarily 100% of the frat. Right? This is very serious stuff. For nearly a decade, unaccompanied children have been suffering in the shadows, and I have to confess, I knew nothing about their suffering until 2021, when I volunteered to help the Biden administration with the crisis at the southern border. As part of Operation Artemis, I was deployed to the Pomona Fairplex Emergency Intake Site in California to help HHS, Office of Refugee Resettlement, reunite children with sponsors in the United States. I thought I was going to help place children in loving homes. Instead, I discovered that children are being trafficked through a sophisticated network that begins with recruiting in home country, smuggling to the U.S. border, and ends when ORR delivers a child to a sponsor. Some sponsors are criminals and traffickers and members of transnational criminal organizations. Some sponsors view children as commodities and assets to be used for earning income. You know, you know what else is absolutely bonkers? That post Epstein, there are still these clueless coincident theorist conspiracy deniers out there. I mean, there's no shortage of these goofs pretending and hallucinating that this isn't a widespread problem. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, how anti-human can you get to just stick your head in the sand and pretend this stuff's not going on just because it has the word conspiracy in it? It's really weird. Megan says, sometimes I feel this case could be a PSYOP to normalize IgG. What, what is IgG? Glitch says, how a surfer protects their beach, we felt it a duty to protect the college girls from some of the frat boys. Yeah, here's the thing about that, though. Like, the, the frat boys, they're kind of the, the, you know, the scummy guys that you see coming. I mean, the ones you got to watch out for are the non-frat, nice guys pretending to be nice guys that take advantage of the college girls. I actually saw a lot more of that. The, I mean, the frat guys, you kind of know what you're getting, so it's kind of, you know, it's you see a wolf for the wolf, whereas the wolf in sheep's clothing, those are tough. Those are a lot tougher. What, what is IgG? Oh, the genealogy work on DNA. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, the whole Koberger situation is really wild, but... I mean, again, it's just, it's kind of weird how, like, coincidence, these coincidence theorists are just so bereft of logic and reason, and, and they're just downright anti-human in denying the suffering of all these victims. This is why we are witnessing an explosion of labor trafficking. Now, whether it's intentional or not, it could be argued that the United States government has become the middleman in a large-scale, multi-billion dollar child trafficking operation that is run by bad actors seeking to profit off of the lives of children. Wow. I mean... Good for her for speaking out as well, because a lot of people who speak out about this stuff, they, they don't have very long lifespans. Created by Congress in 1988, 
The High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas, or HIDTA program, coordinates and assists federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies to address regional drug threats. There are currently a total of 33 HIDTAs in all 50 states and U.S. territories. In 2020, Kootenai County was added to the Oregon-Idaho HIDTA. Three of our victims are from Kootenai County, which includes the city of Coeur d'Alene, about an hour and a half north of Moscow. There are two main drug trafficking routes in northern Idaho. Authorities say traffickers use I-90 and U.S. Route 95 to transport drugs. Idaho State Police say this area had the most illegal drug seizures in Idaho in recent years. These two major highways intersect in the city of Coeur d'Alene, with I-90 running east to west and U.S. Route 95 north to south. 95 South, in fact, connects Coeur d'Alene to Moscow. This major north to south highway actually bisects the city of Moscow. I mean, yeah, a lot of coincidences here. Even though it's a relatively small town, I mean, this is quite coincidental to just absolutely deny that there could be any type of drug connection when, I mean, obviously there very well could be one here, and we'll continue to look into this to see... Denise asked, who is Daddy Green? He's the he's the school president that's a billionaire. The students call him daddy. That's kind of weird. I've never been to a a school where something like that goes on. That's kind of weird. 95 also serves to connect Kootenai County to other high intensity drug trafficking areas in southern Idaho and Oregon. Is it true that um, people in that house have sold products? Yes. Yeah, 100%. And you've bought from them or other people have or you guys like throw down 100%. together? Yep. Yep. All the above. Okay, so again, this is all public record that True Crime Design has published in this video. So apparently the owner, so there's more than one owner of this house. There are co-owners, one of which is supposedly a sex offender. This is kind of weird. Has this been mentioned in the mainstream media anywhere? I mean, is that kind of weird that potentially this, if this is true, if this is true, that one of the co-owners is a sex offender, isn't that weird having this guy rent out to college students? I mean, it, does that seem kind of weird to anybody? I mean, if he's innocent and he can prove it, okay, whatever. But if he's not, I mean, this seems kind of weird. Does anybody find that weird? <laughs> I mean, that just seems kind of a weird thing for sex offenders to be renting homes to young college students. No way. What? Okay, so Megan says that Daddy Green grew up there 
and apparently glitched to saying Green's family owned the house at one time. Okay, this is giving me shades of the Ketty Cabin murders, where supposedly the sheriff owned the Ketty Cabin where everybody was killed, and one of the lead suspects apparently was a roommate with him at that before as well. I mean, this is weird. This is just a high strangeness indeed. I mean, this is absolutely bizarre. I, I mean, just the coincidence stack is getting high here. So you have a potential sex offender co-owning the home, which is apparently some kind of drug party house. Hmm. The owners of the King Road house keeping quiet about the future of the house, and supposedly the co-owner has also asked the neighbors to not speak to the media about the future of the home. Why would he even think he has a right to do that? The neighbors can say whatever they want. I mean, why, why would he even do... Does anybody find it weird that he would actually even ask the neighbors that in the first place? Lori says, too many red flags here. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, there's a whole snack of red flags here. Yeah, Shan, if you haven't checked out the series on Mindshock here, I'd, I'd do an incredible deep dive into the Caddy Cabin case. Yeah, apparently the sheriff owned that cabin, and one of the lead suspects was his roommate in that cabin. It, it's just bonkers. Yeah, it's crazy. Glitch says it gets worse. Yeah, I mean... Wow, okay, let's, uh, let's continue, let's brace ourselves and continue here. You, who do you think was the target? Um, the house. <laughs> if I'm gonna be uh, honest, I think the kids on Greek Row were the, were the target. I think all the kids were the target. I think right. people are taking advantage of these kids, that's what I think. And it could have been any one of our kids. And so this house, and being a real estate broker and doing a lot of construction sales, the, um, and also knowing that Creek Row, they have these little secret panels behind walls and things. That there is crawls throughout that house that are just naturally there from ad, from additions over time and from right. the geotech of the land, the landscape. So that house, and in the, I'm sure in the rafters, likely something could be behind the walls. And so I did call them. And then that night I saw in the news, it was dark. They went back in there and I don't know if they got anything out or not. Office that's partially from Washington, maybe an FBI field office from the Idaho area. So, yeah, this is pretty weird. So, we have more than one individual stating here that the target was the house itself. And that these kids were being exploited. I mean, it's kind of the same story with a lot of crimes. So, they didn't say, obviously, who's top dog here. I mean, are police, are corrupt police above these, these college kids? And they're, they're paying the college kids money what the college kids think is real money, which of course it isn't, but for them it is. And then who's pulling the, sh if the police are corrupt, who's pulling their strings? Does this go all the way up to the Mexican cartels or, or what? I mean, does it involve high ranking people at the University of Idaho? Maybe. I mean, what is really going on here? A lot of, there's been a lot of theories postulated about some kind of church connection in the Moscow area and a lot of shady individuals involved with the churches in the area, or one particular church. So, yeah, it's, it's really tough to make heads or tails here of all of this, but apparently, according to these individuals, the house is the target. Glitched says, Kaylee's dad, what, what about him? What, what about her dad? Oh, was in the church? Do you know anything about the church connection glitch? You seem to be pretty well versed in this case. I've only seen, seen bits and pieces and whispers of connections. Nothing really solid, nothing substantiated. But wait a second, are you saying Kaylee's dad was in that local, in the local church or in... 
a particular type of church that wasn't just local. Are we going into Mineshock land already, Dustin? Look at Amityville, same date and similar address. November 13th, 1974, Ronald DeFeo Jr. shot and killed six members of his family at 112 Ocean Avenue on November 13th. I mean, that's, that's pretty close. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty creepy. <laughs> that is pretty creepy and close, I have to say. Not quite exact, but. Glitch says, yes, the local one. You spoke of Church of Christ. Shan said, mind-blowing. Mind-shocking, if you will. Here on Mind Shock, where the Mind Shocks just don't stop coming. But they, did you ask if they were from FBI or what jurisdiction? And they just said, you know, uh, nothing I, to see here? Yeah, they would not, they would give me nothing. And I did call Moscow police, no answer, no response, so no explanation for any. So I don't know if this is just another parallel to, to Delphi, because apparently. One of the stories in Delphi is that the FBI was clashing with the local PD. They had different theories. FBI went after Ron Logan. Local PD going after other individuals. Again, I don't know if that's true. Apparently, FBI was on the ground before the Delphi murders happened investigating something. So... Yeah, and here we have reports of possible agents, FBI or other agency, who were in and around the home, basically saying nothing to see here. So, if, let's say, if the FBI was investigating police in Idaho, obviously they, would, they wouldn't make that public. So, are they just hanging back and waiting until they have something more solid here to take down the local PD if they believe there is some kind of conspiracy and they're complicit? Or is this even more shady and the FBI is actually involved? Glitch says there was an FBI drug task force. So, is that task force also corrupt? In which case, I mean, does this have any chance of getting solved, if that's the case? of this it's but weird. they were clearly inside on a mission i believe that there's an element that is targeting these kids who are greek because they can't get on greek girls so they target the kids who are greek to work for them and to get involved in all of this nonsense there's Under human Jen. trafficking going on and I yeah i was gonna say make sure you hear that clear guys she said human trafficking not drug trafficking too okay um so yeah that's that's a big deal in that area so DHS defines human trafficking as involving the use of force, fraud, or coercion to obtain some type of labor or commercial sex act. Human traffickers use various forms of force, fraud, and coercion to control and exploit victims. These forms include imposing of debt, fraudulent employment opportunities, false promises of love or a better life, psychological coercion and violence or threats of violence. The crime of human trafficking hinges on the exploitation of another person. People often falsely believe that human trafficking implies victims must be moved from one place to another to qualify as a victim. Human trafficking does not require transportation to be considered a crime. It is a crime that can be committed against an individual who has never left their hometown. Victims can be any age, race, gender, immigration status, socioeconomic status. The Department of Homeland Security considers college students particularly vulnerable to this crime for a variety of reasons, such as living away from home, often for the first time, economic instability and dependence, and the common use of alcohol or substances on college campuses. I mean, this is actually a great awareness campaign right there in and of itself 
Now, where I see there are problems in some of these distinctions is because, especially in the case of some kind of online work, there were early rumors that one or more of the victims might have had some kind of OnlyFans page or something of that nature where, again, it's tough because what percentage are doing it of their own free will with zero coercion and they're just trying to make some extra cash? And in certain cases, if there is drug overlap or other criminal elements involved applying pressure, I mean, how do you make those distinctions? So it's, there's a lot, it seems like there's this, large gradation of a gray area that nobody wants to really look at that seems to be a huge huge problem with a lot of this stuff so yeah i mean it's it's kind of weird because there is a certain connotation with with human trafficking or some of this exploitation that's kind of stuck in the past where they you have to be physically coerced and do all this stuff. But in the modern age, what's to stop some kind of drug dealer giving veiled threats or possibly extending drugs on credit in party situations and maybe not even coercing coercing anybody specifically into into doing cam work or whatever, but almost with the intention of them doing that to get the money. I mean, this huge gray area in, in the post-internet age, yeah, it's, it's really weird. It's really weird. Glitch says she had a nice camera setup. Cam girls common, lots do it. Yeah, there were early rumors, and they were kind of dismissed, even though people were posting screenshots. And obviously, that whole thing is another can of worms, because I don't know that much about it. From what I understood... When OnlyFans first came out, wasn't it kind of like a MySpace or something, or like a Patreon that wasn't really about any kind of adult work? That's how I thought it was. I thought it was like some kind of Patreon. And then at some point, it morphed into specifically the adult angle. Or maybe not. Maybe you can still do regular stuff. on. Maybe you can still do non-adult stuff. I mean, I have no idea. Do, do like musicians have OnlyFans pages that are like totally rated G. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they do. Because even in the name, only fans, you're a fan of somebody and you support them from what I, I mean, I don't know. I don't really remember. I don't remember the year it came out, but I thought it was kind of like a, almost like a paid MySpace support musicians and artists type of thing. Glitch is saying they do. So it's not exclusive for adult stuff. Okay. So what does it mean even if somebody did post her page? I mean, it could be an innocent modeling page or something like that. I don't know. So that doesn't, I guess that doesn't really mean anything nefarious off the bat. But again, we don't know. So I guess that's unknown. The other weird thing is, would anybody come forward even if they did know? Because they might think that that paints the victims in a bad light. But if it, here's the problem. Because if they were coerced into doing that, and that's going to lead to to the criminals, to the murderers, or the pe the people that are involved in this, by not coming forward with that information, you might be robbing a victim of justice. Fubar Temp says John Cena has an OnlyFans. Okay, so it's not it it's just like a any fan type of page then. So that doesn't mean anything. I don't know. How much does John Cena make? What does he post on there? Just like the same stuff he posts on his other social media? Okay, that's weird. So, a po so yeah, I just looked it up. So, he just made an OnlyFans, but it's part of some kind of promoting his movie <laughs> I mean it looks like he kind of did it as a gag 
and not like a real i mean why would anybody i mean i don't know would people that don't need money do i mean i'd have no idea I, I thought again i thought it was some kind of like musician artist thing at the beginning and it seems to be turned into some kind of cam adult cam something huh yeah, so I don't know what that means, but again, in the context of the criminality of human trafficking, if they're being coerced into doing that, obviously that would be a crime. Glitch says, it has lots of followers to grab. The weird thing is, though, yeah, I don't know. Someone posted a screenshot, I think, of of a possible page of Madison's, and immediately people started trashing it. But again, that doesn't really mean anything. It could have just been a page used as a regular social media page. So I have no idea what that means. Dustin says, you're in the rabbit hole now. I've followed this case from day one. The main thing you need to understand is this was premeditated. What do you think, Dustin? This was some kind of sorority frat situation because of jealousy? Or was it involved with crime, drugs, or both? Or both. Because, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, apparently there's a sixth roommate, AC, and she was best buddies with Madison, maybe. And then there was some kind of falling out. You know, it's weird glitched. I, I don't really like to have anything to do with Instagram, but it seems like Instagram is, is not quite G-rated. There's like a lot of smut crap on there. And so I don't know. Again, I'm kind of old school. I don't really look at, I don't really do social media other than YouTube here. And, yeah, so I, I never understood the whole uh, take 50 billion photos and glam filter them up every single night for whatever reason, but I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, it's very difficult to make heads or tails here, but again, if these were, if this was a coerced situation, I mean, that's where the criminality would be. Traffickers use drugs and alcohol as tools to lure potential victims, groom them, and ultimately control them. They exploit individuals' opioid use or substance use disorders to coerce them into trafficking, knowing that they are more vulnerable than individuals without substance use disorders. Human trafficking is the second largest criminal enterprise on this planet, just behind illegal drug trafficking. According to the DOJ, it is a $150 billion per year global industry with an estimated 27 million victims worldwide at any given time. Yeah, I mean that that is shocking. I'm not I I'm not that surprised about the victim number, but I would have guessed it would have been way more than that. I would I would have thought it could potentially be in the trillions just because once you add the Epstein blackmail type situations I mean, that could open up the door to, to multi-billion, hundred billion, you know, per incident type situations. But yeah, I mean, this is very sad all at the same time. Many experts estimate that human trafficking will soon overtake drug trafficking as the largest criminal enterprise. See, for many traffickers, it doesn't matter what product is being sold. Drugs, sex, and labor are all highly lucrative markets. Violent criminals like this see no difference as long as money is made. For example, cartels will often use trafficked women to smuggle drugs across the border, doubling the exploitation and the money they can take from them. Traffickers use insecurity, embarrassment, fear of retaliation, and intimidation to control their victims. Some victims of human trafficking can feel like their new lifestyle was a choice, and so they really have no one else to blame for their current situation. I'm not suggesting that our victims were being sex trafficked or engaging in commercial sex at all for that matter. I simply don't have any evidence of this. That being said, I do think some of the information that has been uncovered about the victims' lives leading up to their murders does point to the possibility of human trafficking activity, specifically as it pertains to the forced labor aspect of the definition. 
This is not a supposition I make lightly, so I will back it up by breaking down the three elements that are required to constitute the crime of human trafficking for the purposes of forced labor. Acts plus means plus purpose equals the crime of trafficking. All three elements must be met in order to constitute the crime. The acts element is met when the trafficker recruits, harbors, transports, provides, or obtains a person for labor or services. In this situation, I think that local gang members and drug dealers recruit students, especially sorority girls, to be their on-campus dealers. The means element refers to the trafficker's use of force, fraud, or coercion. Wait a second. So she's... Is she kind of saying that there's an intentional strategy to use pretty sorority girls as dealers? I mean, from a pure business point of view, I mean, you could see how that could make sense, kind of have like having a pretty waitress at a restaurant. Mm, that's really sick, though, if you really think about it. But then again, these criminals, I mean, they don't care about anybody. So I guess, I mean, that's... You can't say that they wouldn't want to do that, but that's, that's really messed up. This is where the manipulation, intimidation, and threats of violence come into play. I'll provide some specific examples of this in a minute. And the last element, purpose, focuses on the perpetrator's goal to exploit a person's labor or services. Here, this would refer to the facilitation of sales and distribution of drugs throughout the UI campus, specifically the Greek life community. Frankly, a lot of mysterious deaths, violence, and bizarre circumstances indicative of gang activity occur on UI's campus, specifically surrounding Greek life and the King Road neighborhood. And it seems like every single time, Moscow police does not ask any questions. They are all too willing to look the other way. Freaky though. I don't know why they shoved everything in my suitcase. Can I get my case number? Honestly, I think you're right. I think if I took a, a wild guess, maybe they were trying to take your car and yeah, they were like. I need these clothes. Copy. The stuff they put in my suitcase is so random. There's no chance someone's playing a prank on you. Yeah, I didn't think so. I don't okay. see why anyone I know would ever do that. Yeah. But like. Oh, and yeah, then I found my underwear, like, shoved right there. Was it in the cup holder? Yeah, and I took it out. But it was in there, and I was like, that's really weird. And you said nothing's missing of, of your knowledge? Not that I can tell. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, you're good. Like, not this side either. Yeah. Take one. I'll, I'll, I don't, I tend yeah, to forget yeah, to lock my car. Bad. People think, oh, it's Moscow, it's, I mean. Yeah. They know it's safe, but that. there's always, yeah. I'm just glad did. I took my TV out. That would yeah. suck. Yep. Do you have any questions or anything? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Right. Is this an alpha fee? Like, yeah. That? All right. Okay. Sweet. Nice. How did you know? Or alpha we fee on your pants. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the morning of May 1st, 2022, just about six months before the murders, 19-year-old freshman Hudson Lindau was found dead in a creek on UI's campus just a stone's throw away from Creek Row. Police almost immediately ruled out foul play, and it was ruled an accidental drowning, and everyone just kind of moved on. The weird thing about a lot of these, every time I see a case where it's immediately foul play not suspected, well, how would... That's kind of a weird thing to say. I mean, wouldn't you just say it's being investigated? Like a lot of in, in legit cases, they're usually saying no comment. You know, it's still under invest currently under investigation. Yeah, glitch the filleted coyotes and then the other skin dog. I mean, there's yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is really weird. I mean, does this happen on other campuses? I mean, this much weirdness and strange deaths. I mean, on the really, really big campuses, maybe with just, you know, the most populated campuses in the U.S. Because, you know, a lot of drugs and partying going on. But University of Idaho is not exactly the most populous campus. 
but questions remain as to how he got in this creek and could have drowned in what appears to be very shallow water. Here's a picture of Hudson at what appears to be the 1118 house, which is the same address where the body cam footage of the car burglary occurred just two months before his death. And as you can see, the 1122 house is in the background. Hudson Lindau's death is very similar to a 2013 mysterious death that also occurred on a Saturday night on the campus of University of Idaho. UI freshman Joseph Widerick, 18, was seen drinking at a fraternity house on January 19, 2013, and slipped out shortly after midnight. Investigators believe he wandered off for about four hours, eventually taking cover under a bridge where he died of hypothermia. Once again, the possibility of foul play quickly ruled out if even considered. In 2017, several Greek row houses woke up to a grisly sight, dead coyotes on their front doorsteps. We were like, I guess unsure why that was happening, but we got rid of it, said Pi Kappa Phi President Ethan Ennis. Ennis says these coyote killings were pretty gruesome. The coyote's body was mangled and he says the sorority across the street got it even worse. Ennis said, at Pi Beta Phi, there was more blood on the doorstep, even some smeared on the window. Police said it appears the coyotes were shot, which they are quick to point out is not illegal in Idaho. Moscow police say on January 20th, a student left a coyote carcass at a sorority as part of a drunken dare. It's still unclear if this incident is related. Quote, we don't have enough information as to who actually committed it, so we don't know if it's a continuation of that prank or if someone else is doing something, end quote, said Moscow Police Captain Tyson Barrett. In the state of Idaho, all you need is a hunting license. You don't need a tag or anything like that, and you can hunt on public land, said Barrett. So once again, we have Moscow police dismissing disturbing and menacing behavior against students, specifically Greek life students, as just a silly prank, a mere coincidence, or completely unrelated to deeper issues that may suggest that Moscow perhaps isn't such a safe community. You know what else is weird, though? Um, not just with the coyote stuff, but all the social media stuff with the horror movies and the slasher themes. I mean, see, all these things by themselves, you can kind of maybe write it off, just weird stuff happening at a college. But now you add in a quadruple homicide, and then all of a sudden, it's kind of hard to say that none of this is related. It's kind of weird. I brought this theory up, I brought this up in a previous episode that if Brian Koberger, if some frat or sorority people, they wanted a patsy. So if he's involved, if he buys drugs or sells drugs from them or knows other people involved in the circle, what if they pretended they were going to go prank these people at this house to scare them and they got Koberger to go with them and then they really killed them and now Koberger is implicated and Koberger didn't know that that was the that's what they were going to do I mean why wouldn't he blow the whistle on them I don't know maybe if one of them is the son or relative or connected to a high-ranking individual I mean, Koberger's supposedly the smart guy. He, he might kind of understand that people might not believe that. Or even if, I mean, what's he going to say? It's just, it's tough. It's tough to kind of figure that out if that's what happened. Again, I'm not saying that's what happened. That's also kind of a weird thing. I mean, yes, yeah, supposedly they investigated it, but it's just so hard to say something's not connecting that's happening right before a quadruple homicide or within a certain short time frame.
That's a weird thing to say. No, the prosecutor says no evidence the Idaho killings were drug-related. At a drug party house. I mean, it might be better to say no conclusive evidence, but to say no evidence at all, that's a weird thing to say. Almost as if intentionally covering this all up. Could drugs be involved in all of this? I have not heard that there's any suspicion that drugs played a role in the killings. So not like a drug deal gone bad or something like that? I am not aware of anything like that, no. Huh. Wait, are people... I haven't heard this theory that people were theorizing that this poor skinned dog was some kind of a warning shot to Kaylee. And if that's connected with the stalker and connected to the coyotes, then everything would be connected, right? <sighs> to just write it all off as coincidence... Because, okay... Let's look at other college murders that occurred in other towns. Were there also skin coyotes and dogs? Were there also these incidents around the time of the murder? I mean, I haven't heard of a single case where that happened. Maybe it did. I just, it just seems like it's a, it's a tough sell to say that none of this weird, all these weird animal killings have absolutely nothing to do with what happened. That a known drug party house has absolutely no connection to the death. I mean, it's just weird to hallucinate to know for sure that none of this is related. So this is an this is interesting on the timeline. Okay, so let's let's go over this again. So supposedly Kaylee, she's in a sorority or possibly got kicked out or left at a certain period of time. She has a stalker, at least one. Some people are actually theorizing there were more. She's got at least one. She posts a photo of her and her dog on social media. Three days later, three miles away, a dog is skinned alive and killed. Then Kaylee leaves and doesn't want to come back, but does, and the weekend she comes back, coincidentally, is the quadruple homicide. Now, is this all coincidental? Is this all coincidental? Maybe. Again, I don't claim anything is true or untrue. Are all the strange deaths coincidental? Or is all the drug activity coincidental? Is the destruction of the house coincidental? I mean, how many things are we going to have to believe are coincidental in order to believe that nothing's related? Now, maybe some things are related and other things aren't. Let's not fall for false dichotomy logical fallacies here. But to hallucinate that they're all definitely not related, that, that, that is not an intelligent hallucination. Now, obviously, we don't know. Whoever wasn't there, they don't know. I mean, the other thing that's really shocking here, Kaylee would have... Pro I mean, does anybody think Kaylee wouldn't have said something to the people around her, either in, the, in that same house, so either the other roommates know, to her other family members, who for whatever reason might have not wanted to... If the information is that critical... Obviously, they wouldn't re reveal it. So maybe she did tell people something. You guys are really going in hard on Officer Payne and the possible Kapaka connection, which I went over in other episodes. Some people actually theorize that Koberger and Kopaka somehow knew each other all the way back in Pennsylvania. Denise says, it's scary realizing how easy it would be to falsely accuse someone and convict them when there is no transparency and corrupt law enforcement in the mix. Yeah, and let's not forget about the internal affairs investigation in Moscow, Idaho. 
So to all the coincidence theorist goofs who are hallucinating that law enforcement couldn't possibly be corrupt, I mean, there's literal internal affairs investigations here. I mean, even if there weren't, obviously law enforcement would still be corrupt, but you actually have internal affairs investigations here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, this is a tough case. This is a tough case. You have, you have four different victims. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much potentially going on here. I believe the locks were changed. Uh, I think they actually touch upon it in this video. Let's, let's get to it. Oh, right there. Good. Wow. Good timing glitched. I mean, literally within seconds. Wow. Yeah, I mean, and why would he do that? Like, I mean, obviously law enforcement has all of their communications. But what, what, were, what were the victims all saying to each other in, let's say, even the week or the, in the week to month before the murders? I mean, it's just, it's so difficult to believe there's zero paper trail of anything. I mean, there's literally Madison on video saying, I told Adam everything. I mean, think, I mean, think about that, because if there's literally on video, I told Adam everything, hmm, I mean, how much, it, how much of a, of a trail is there between phone calls, messages, and text messages? If there's already a video circulating, I told Adam everything. I mean, how do we just ignore all that? It's kind of weird. How do you just ignore all of that? So only a few days? Wow. And the guy says you, they're gonna get you guys? I mean, is that all coincidental? Is that all coincidental? So it doesn't say how many days, but it says Xana's dad worked on the door locks days before. So that was only her door? Only her door? Hmm. Like, why would he do that, though? So did so. What did what did Madison and Kaylee tell her? And so there's a report of a stalker regarding Kaylee. Madison is saying that she told some guy named Adam everything. And the response is, they're going to get you guys. And there's people out there saying this is all coincidental. I mean, what are the chances that Brian Koberger is planning this and it all goes down within this timeline? The weird thing is, I mean, you would think there'd be more of an alibi. The main thing with Koberger that people forget, he didn't cancel his doctor's appointment right after the murder. And apparently, there's nothing on his body. I mean, that's kind of weird. I don't know. Supposedly, there was some kind of scuffle with Ethan. Would someone not cancel a doctor's... And if this was all premeditated, why would you schedule a doctor's appointment the day after you're going to commit, or however many days, two days after you're going to commit a quadruple homicide? I mean... Possibly you might have somebody else's, you might have some injuries or whatever. That's a weird thing to me. I mean, obviously the, the Elantra doesn't even match wrong year, wrong body style. So his car doesn't match the uncanceled doctor's appointment. I mean, nothing really adds up with Koberger unless the frats were specifically trying to frame him for some reason. 
you would think it would be easy. See, what if the, if the police were in on it? If the frats and the police were in on framing Koberger, then maybe that would make sense. Because then they wouldn't care if he's got an alibi or whatever. Megan says, PSYOP, what if BK is on board with it, not framed or guilty? <laughs> wow, you got me there, Megan. Even I didn't think of that theory. <laughs> you got me there. Hats off to Megan Z. That is a theory even I did not go through. Wow. Yeah. This is stuff that shouldn't happen, especially in a small, quiet town like Moscow is, where we're heavily uh, involved with the university. And these are things that affect not just town, but the university, the students, lends everybody. Whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't even see this case. Former UI professor kills student. 2011, Katie Benoit. Wow. I do not remember seeing anything about this. So uiidaho.edu, the Katie Benoit Campus Safety Awareness Month. Huh. So apparently there have been issues. Wow. I mean, there were even marches, take back the night. Wow. This is crazy. So apparently, University of Idaho has been having safety issues for a long time. NBC News, professor, student romance. Ends in murder-suicide. A college professor who alternately referred to himself as a psychopathic killer and the beast killed himself after fatally shooting a graduate student he had recently dated, police said, in newly revealed court documents. This is an article, NBC News, Jesse Bonner, April, uh, August 24th, 2011. A college professor who alternately referred to himself as psychopathic killer and the beast killed himself after fatally shooting a graduate student he had recently dated, police said in newly revealed court documents. The body of former University of Idaho professor Ernesto A. Bustamante, 31, was found early Tuesday in a Moscow hotel room after he apparently shot himself in the head with a revolver, police said. Katie Benoit, 22 had been killed on the front porch of her Moscow home a day earlier. Her two roommates told police they had been baking cookies late Monday when Benoit stepped outside for a cigarette and about two minutes later they heard gunfire. Benoit was shot multiple times with a 45 caliber handgun. A neighbor, Lauren Hetzler, told police he heard the shots and saw a man whom police later, who authorities later identified as Bustamante leaving the home in a dark, trench coat and hat. A police affidavit filed Tuesday offers details of the relationship between Bustamante and Benoit, including violent encounters that were described by their friends and roommates. Megan Walker Smith and Emma Gregory, Benoit's roommates, told police that the romance ended in March. Gregory told authorities that Benoit, after the breakup, had said Bustamante had pointed a handgun on her on multiple occasions and at one point had put a gun in her mouth, according to the statement. Benoit's roommates told police they had been concerned for her well-being because Bustamante had weapons and multiple personalities. Rowdy J. Hope, who told police he was a close friend of Bustamante. Seriously? This guy's named Rowdy Hope? Man, that's weird. Confirmed that Bustamante had multiple handguns and multiple personality disorders to include one Bustamante calls a psychopathic killer and another Bustamante calls the beast, Moscow Police Sergeant Bruce Fager said in the affidavit. 
troubling behavior. Benoit had filed a complaint with the university in June over Bustamante's behavior, and he was either fired or forced to resign as a result, according to the police affidavit. Fager said it is unclear how the university handled the complaint because it was treated as a personnel matter and was confidential. The university has said Bustamante resigned effective Friday, but declined to comment on any specifics related to his employment, including saying whether Benoit had been one of his students citing public records laws in the ongoing investigation. Okay, this is really weird, though. Huh. Bustamante took a job at the University of Idaho in August 2007 and was an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology and Communication. Huh. Yeah, this is weird. So there's, there's a weird history. I mean, that seems to me like it would be unrelated, but there's just a history of strange activity at the University of Idaho, strange deaths and murders. Huh. Glitched, are you really bringing up the Jazzercise Conspiracy now? By the way, there's an episode 2 coming on that one, Glitched. You're not going to want to miss that. There's, there might be some MK Ultra activity connected to Jazzercise. Okay, so, I mean, what does everybody think about just the oddities at the University of Idaho? Because... They're just, there's all these strange deaths, literal murders, animal killings. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, 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 I mean, I don't know. It doesn't seem like this is a regular university. I mean, obviously universities have deaths and accidental deaths, suicides, and even murders. But there seems to be quite a bit here relative to the population. So total enrollment, 2017, 12,000 students. Wow, only 6,900 full-time. I mean, that's not a lot of students. That's really not. This is not a big school. For example, UMass Amherst has over 28,000 students. So, <sighs> Texas A&M has almost 75,000 students. So, yeah, I mean, this is weird. I mean, University of Idaho is not a big school. So, Considering the size of the school, this seems really, really unusual. If it was just a gigantic school, then maybe not, but it's just such a small school. Denise says, it seems very satanic in nature to me, so much evil. I mean, one of the most mind-shocking things for me, again, is the fact that Moscow was named in connection with the Jean Benet Ramsey case and satanic ritual abuse. Specifically named Moscow, Idaho. Yeah, Peter, it's hard to believe that the animal killings were not linked to the murders because unless there's random animal killings every year, which it seems that there are not. If there were, then we can say it's not connected. But it seems, I mean, this is just very, very unusual. Due to a sense of insecurity about what's going on here and why. I'll tell you what's going on in Moscow, in my personal opinion. Contrary to the narrative describing Moscow as the embodiment of a quaint little college town where nothing bad ever happens, a darker force seems to linger in the shadows. It is clear to me that an organized crime syndicate, perhaps enforced by local and regional gang members, has gripped control of this community. This ruthless syndicate appears to have corrupted Moscow's power-hungry local authorities and compromised its money-driven institutions, exploiting the vulnerable and leaving everyone else in a state of fear, 
helplessness, and compliance. As Kim suggested, it appears that Greek life and the King Road neighborhood specifically is a target market for drug traffickers for obvious reasons. This operation is lucrative and organized. I believe they send in corrupted cops to intimidate and monitor the activity of the key addresses used for stashing and trafficking drugs. Likely through psychological manipulation, false promises of economic prosperity, and even coercion by exploiting substance use disorders, these students are, in my opinion, lured into accepting a deal that they did not fully understand the repercussions of. One day, you think you're just becoming the casual plug for the friend group or sorority so you can afford spring break and eyelash extensions. Everything is fine. You're not a drug dealer, you're just a broke college student with bills, sorority dues, and debt to pay. But now you're known around campus, all the frat guys want your number, and it's a good feeling to hook your friends up and have some beer money in your pocket. Besides, you're like totally cool with your suppliers, everyone knows them, they'll even stick around to smoke a blunt after dropping off product. It's just a side hustle and you believe you can opt out at any time. But now it's senior year and things are starting to heat up. Your suppliers are under stress and have dropped the friendly facade, taking on a much more menacing, even threatening demeanor. Things are getting scary and it's just not worth it anymore. You and your friends decide you want out. But now all of a sudden you have cops banging on your doors and collecting your information, elusive individuals following you around downtown, and perhaps even more sinister messages of intimidation intended to get you and your friend group to fall back in line or else. Wow, that was one of the creepiest segments of video I've ever seen in my life. I was not prepared for that. I mean, <laughs> that's really creepy, and unfortunately that seems to be a true situation for a lot of people, whether they end up dead or not. I mean, how many hardened criminals really start off that way? I mean, that was just, that was one of the creepiest segments of video I have ever seen simply because just the realism of it. You can totally see how, you can totally see how somebody could, be, a very good-hearted, naive person could have been lured into that in such a simple way. And then all of a sudden the police harassment starts, the stalking starts, the messages start. I mean, I actually didn't, I didn't consider the theory that they wanted out and severed ties completely. But if they did, that could explain it. But what is Ethan's role here? Or even Xana's? It was Xana not involved, but she knew that Madison and or Kaylee were? Why? I mean, the other thing is people might not understand the level of danger they're really in. Because if they did, would they all leave and never come back? Yes, Glitched. I'm aware of that argument. You Do you believe that argument was connected? Do you think he was standing up for Madison and or Kaylee? If Xana's not involved simply because they're the roommates? And was he staying there overnight specifically because he knew there was a threat and none of them understood the severity of the threat? I mean, this is all... I mean, again, I'm not saying this theory is true, but if it is, it actually seems to fit the available data more than any other theory from what I see so far. Because to believe that it's a random serial killer psycho that just happened by that night, ignoring all this entire coincidence stack about stalkers killed animals, I mean, it really, if they really did back out of some kind of a drug trafficking situation, because the previous theories were that they owed money or something of that nature. I couldn't quite connect that, but if they actually wanted to sever all ties, but why would Kaylee come back that weekend? What was the story being peddled? She wanted to show off her new car or something? Does that make sense if they're severing all ties? 
Or was there something going on that Kaylee wasn't aware of regarding Madison and or Zayna and Ethan? I mean, this, this theory that True Crime Design laid out is definitely seems to be the best so far. But th there are still missing pieces. Why would Kaylee come back? Peter says, I think there's a secret that someone didn't want getting out behind all of this. And that murder dog was definitely one. Yeah, that's a good point, Peter. If, if let's say they are severing ties with the drug dealers or whatever, but there's also something else going on. There's also some possibly a jealousy angle. Possibly something going on with the sixth roommate who doesn't live there, AC. Who was be supposedly best buddies with Madison and then something happened and now she's not. This is all very, very weird. Did Kaylee ever talk to you about a potential stalker? She did. She did. Sometimes she would contact us and say, you won't believe this guy was following me around. I felt weird. You leave town, change your locks, and keep your head down, just hoping to make it to graduation and get the hell out of this town. But what are you supposed to do when those tasked with protecting you, ensuring your safety and respecting your rights are complicit in the harassment and beneficiaries of your exploitation? You see, like you, they made their own deals with the devil. And, and why is James, I mean, again, it could be out of context, but... I did not like that smile on James Fry. Let's look at that again. You see, I mean, I don't know if that's even, well, it says News Nation. I don't think they were, had anything to do with James Fry before this investigation, but. The harassment and beneficiaries of your exploitation. I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. Something seems off about him, any? Because wasn't he? What was the Copaca situation where James Fry w went to Pullman for that? Because that's not his jurisdiction. So that was another oddity curiosity that I noticed as well. People are thinking that Kaylee's father is a fed. I mean, the one thing I kind of noticed, he, he is extremely well composed, but that doesn't mean he's a fed. Oh yeah, it is possible Payne was at Pullman also. Yeah, that's, yes, Peter. It, I mean, the coincidence stack here is just insane. SWAT offs this guy. I mean, how often does that happen? Now, if, apparently never. But if these things happen every single year, the animal slings, then you could say maybe they're not related. But it seems like all of this is only happening, happening around this quadruple homicide. Like you, they made their own deals with the devil and likewise are expected to fall in line. 
Part two will examine drug-related corruption or narco-corruption as it's sometimes called, and its devastating impact on the community of Moscow. How the authorities let down these four young students and proceeded to cover it all up to save their own skin. Please don't get distracted by the conspiracy theories, and I'll just be perfectly blunt. The nonsense that some people put out there just to stir the pot, that hurts the families all the more. That hurts the community all the more. And that's something, that's something authorities always say in every case where there was proven to be a conspiracy. Like, even, what was it, 9-11? I mean, there was a bunch where, you know, <laughs> official individuals were saying oh yeah make sure you don't listen to the conspiracy theories i mean if they're that silly and easy to dismiss why would you even waste the time and energy talking about that megan i have not seen the moscow pd recruitment video Was it the recent one from four months ago? Moscow Police Department join our team? Is that the one you're talking about? Okay, let's let's look at it. I'll I'll put it up here in a second. There's one, yeah, there's, um, I'll put up the most recent one, yeah, four months ago, actually, yeah. I'll put it up in a second. Always oh, some astute researchers in the chat, of course. I think everybody gets into this f to help people, and I personally think this is the best way for me to be able to help people. We get to make genuine connections with the community here, and those connections help us to make true change and to help people the best we can. And we have an opportunity to affect that change just through our ability to listen, understand, and really have an impact on a more personal level. Is it the best way for everybody? Absolutely not. But for the people that are meant to do this job, I think it's the best way we can help. Oh, wow. I mean, I don't know. Is this par for the course? I haven't seen a lot of recruitment videos, so I don't know if this is uh, par for the course. But I mean, man, the music here. Wow. Wow. In all, teamwork is the essence of our culture. We really value treating our fellow officers with respect. We here at Moscow have built a very high standard. We really work uh, as a cohesive machine through some of- Also, interesting note, comments are disabled on this video. Those more critical situations. I would say Moscow Police Department has a culture that highly values doing things the correct way, doing things to standard, training to standard, and that leads to a culture at the PD that really emphasizes looking after one another, but also making sure that we hire the right people to continue our organization. I believe the Moscow Police Department is a perfect sized wow. department. 
With Moscow being so small, one of the big advantages is officers get the opportunities to promote quickly, to get into specialties quickly, and to advance and become well-rounded in their jobs uh, much sooner than other officers do at larger agencies. Um, I currently run our firearms department. I am a firearms instructor, uh, taser instructor, field training officer, part of our negotiations team for crisis and hostage negotiations. I think that's all. <laughs> Being a part of these specialties has challenged me to take on new responsibilities, which have accelerated my career in law enforcement and sculpted me into a well-rounded officer. You know, you know what's kind of weird? This could probably pass off as a parody as well. ...and mentor for my peers. I think a lot of people would imagine a small department like ours doesn't have some of the things we do. We have a traffic unit, we have detectives, canine. I've had the opportunity to be the first canine handler here in Moscow and Ragnar has been great at his job. It's been a great honor to work with such a cool dog and have such a great tool to combat drug crime in our area. You know, we're currently sitting in a multi-million dollar facility. Including a huge locker room. With I mean, the, the propaganda is thick here. It is thick. With individual lockers, a gym, a couple of years back, we put it on a bond asking the community for their support. And if it weren't for those community relationships that we have, that would have never come to fruition. And uh, we're very, very thankful for that. The individuals that work for our department truly enjoy working for our department in in our community, myself included. I thoroughly enjoy coming to work every day and look forward to it. If you took a circle on the map that was a two hour radius from Moscow, you would get everything that the world has to offer. You have world-class whitewater, some of the best snowboarding and skiing. You have fishing and hunting, and of course, miles upon miles of wilderness, uncharted. I mean, this is a special little pocket of the world here. Being in the Moscow area, I mean, it does look like a very beautiful area, that's for sure. Area, you know, we're two hours away from some of the best fly fishing anybody could ever dream of. We all know that being a police officer at times is not the easiest job, so being able to be out with nature is a great way to decompress. If the outdoors aren't really... Are they trying to recruit people from all over the country? your thing. Of course, we have the huge concert events. We have the arts, fine dining, fine shopping. You know, it certainly is a place to explore everything that Northern Idaho has to offer. I enjoy the opportunities I have to keep Moscow an enjoyable and livable community through proactive policing. My favorite community event is the Lee Newbill Safety Fair. The Safety Fair is a meaningful tribute to our agency's sole line of duty death, Officer Lee Newbill. This is a big annual event for us where we size and provide helmets for our young bicyclists and provide other services such as conducting car seat checks. My personal favorite is National Night Out. So we hold it every year, usually in the summer months down on Main Street. Uh, it's just a great opportunity for us to come face to face with the citizens in the community. They get to come see all of our equipment and we get to talk to them and we get to further build those relationships we already have with people in the community. Also, the community is very friendly here. I get thanked for wearing the. So I just found something interesting while I was uh, watching this borderline parody video i mean it's they're walking a fine line with parody but apparently does anybody know the origin of the word moscow i was looking through the etymology of moscow in sanskrit it means to drown which is interesting because of all the accidental deaths in the shallow water of those uh of those students supposed drug overdose or accidental deaths they're they're face down in these rivers drowning in a small amount of water apparently in sanskrit it means to drown hmm that's pretty weird huh I mean, I don't know what Moscow, Idaho was named after. I'm kind of assuming 
it was named after Moscow, Russia, like many, many cities in the U.S. are named after other cities, like Athens, Georgia, or whatever, all these cities. Hmm, that is kind of weird. I was trying to find more occult references. Moscow has acquired several epithets, mostly referring to its size and preeminent status within the nation. The Third Rome, White Stone One, First Throne, Forty Sorokes. Moscow is one of the twelve hero cities. Huh. Yeah, I wasn't expecting the the to drown etymology. Also from the 1300s, of or pertaining to the head, as in the capital, or the chief, the first. Hmm, that's weird. Oh, wow. Hmm. For whatever reason, I don't know why this is showing up, but... On etimonline.com, no relation to Moscow. It's just on the more to explore section. It brings up Russia, Kremlin capital, and also pimp, one who provides others with the means and opportunity of gratifying their sexual lusts. Circa 1600 of unknown origin. Why would that be under Moscow? In etymonline.com, the online etymology dictionary. That's kind of weird. That's definitely kind of weird. Huh. All right, let's continue this commercial. I think it's almost over. A uniform all the time, even though we all know that's not what we got into the job for. It, it always feels good for someone to appreciate a job that is underappreciated in today's day and age. By far, my favorite part of working in law enforcement has been the ability to make an impact and provide that level of safety and security that we all enjoy to our community members. And specifically here at the Moscow Police Department, being able to provide that impact in the community where I've chosen to live and raise my family means the world to me. I also like being in an area where there's two college towns because it just brings a different dynamic to a city. The university has a really strong, uh, wonderful partnership and relationship with the city of Moscow Police Department. It, it, is, it is great. Some of the things we do are foot patrols around campus. We're working every event, football games, concerts. We are a security detail for the university. It is so... This is kind of crazy. So they have this strong connection with the University of Idaho and the students. I mean, they didn't do such a great job in preventing this quadruple homicide while literally parked down the street. Um, that's that's kind of weird to me that they would be trying to parade this around. Hmm. Wow. Also, another point about Moscow, uh, the Sanskrit meaning to drown, it doesn't... Drown doesn't have to be in water. You can drown in blood, metaphorically. You can drown in a lot of things. You can drown in drugs. So that is an interesting name. Huh. Reassuring and wonderful to have that kind of connection for our students and our employees. And so this is just a wonderful environment for living in. It's really... I guess a paradise for people that want to raise a family. Um, we have a lot of great biking trails, a lot of great farmers markets and community events. The schools, the parks, the safety in the community. Moscow is rated one of the top places in Idaho to, to raise a family. This is a wonderful town for getting to know your neighbors where you can feel that connection to the larger community. Whether it's coaching football or in the job capacity, it's easier to be involved with everybody. I knew it was gonna be the right place to raise a family and have them live the best life 
that they can possibly live. Every criteria that you would be looking for, it's easy to find here in Moscow. MPD is a fantastic place to work. Yeah, they really laid it on thick there. They laid it on thick. But yeah, wow, I mean, man, that was definitely weird. That was definitely weird. Peter says here, I believe the names of places have something to do with the things that happen in them, like missing 411. A lot of people go missing or get found dead. Places with devil in the name. Yeah. Glitch says Brent and Brett were both airborne rangers. Kind of stacking up here. Not to mention, even their names are almost identical. Brent and Brett. Alright, let's continue this one here. Oh, okay. So the true crime design video, that was the end of that one. So now let's get into Emma Bailey. So... Yeah, this is a theory that's been around for a little bit. So a few a few articles here. Let's go to Daily Chronicle, June 1st, 2023. Case against pair allegedly connected to March overdose death in Centralia referred to King County. We have just this repetition of the word King also everywhere. Moscow and King. Emma Bailey, 22, of Moscow, Idaho, and Demetrius R. Robinson, 36, of Tacoma, appear in Lewis County Superior Court earlier this year. The Lewis County Prosecutor's Office has forwarded the case against two people allegedly connected to a March overdose death to the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, the Centralia Police Department said in a news release on Wednesday, the King County Prosecutor's Office will make its own independent charging decision for the case. Charges had not been filed in King County as of Wednesday, May 31st, the Chronicle confirmed. The Centralia Police Department conducted the overdose death investigation and referred the case to the Lewis County Prosecutor's Office for charging in March. A Lewis County Superior Court judge granted the Lewis County Prosecutor's Officer's motion to dismiss the cases against Emma Bailey, 22, of Moscow, Idaho, and Demetrius R. Robertson, 36, of Tacoma, on Thursday, May 25th, and release orders for both COVID defendants were approved the same day. The two were each charged in March with one count of conspiracy to commit violation of the Uniform Controlled Substances Act in Lewis County Superior Court following a joint narcotics enforcement team investigation the specific reasons for asking the cases to be dismissed were not clarified in the public court documents however the centralia police department stated wednesday the dismissals were due to a determination made during the investigation quote that king county was the appropriate venue for prosecution end quote the conclusion was reached after Bailey's attorney raised the question of prosecutorial jurisdiction, according to the news release. Bailey and Robinson were accused of delivering cocaine to a 22-year-old man who was visiting from the University of Idaho in Moscow shortly before he overdosed at a party in Seattle the night of March 20th. He received care at Harborview Medical for the overdose before he was discharged at 2 a.m. and picked up by the friend who lives in Centralia. 
Officers with the Centralia Police Department responded about 9 a.m. March 21st to a report that the man who was found by his friend inside an apartment in the 3000 block of Borst Avenue. Borst Avenue? As in Borscht? A Russian, a Russian food? What? And Moscow, Idaho? Like, who settled the Moscow area in Idaho? I actually don't know the history of that was unconscious and not breathing, according to a news release from the police department. The friend told law enforcement the man went to sleep and stopped breathing shortly before the friend called 911, according to the court documents. Before the release on Thursday, Bailey and Robinson had been in custody on $100,000 bail since March 21st, awaiting a May 30th trial date. I actually haven't even found an update on this. May 29th. So they were released, oh, there is an update here, May 29th, they were re released days before the trial. So what is going on here? Did, were they just released with no charges filed? Is this because they're connected to the Moscow case and they're possibly CIs or were involved in that operation and they don't want to compromise anything? Because they're not going to blow the whistle, so they just get left, they just get let off the hook. <sighs> this is wild. I mean, this is, this is, this is crazy. I mean, Moscow, Idaho does have a Wikipedia entry. Population 25,000 as of 2020 census. Apparently, indigenous people inhabited what is now Moscow. The Nez Perce, the Palouse, and the Coeur d'Alene people. Miners and farmers began arriving in northern Idaho after the Civil War. The first settlers came to the Moscow area 153 years ago in 1871. Huh. When the first U.S. post office opened in 1872, the town was called Paradise Valley, but the name changed to Moscow in 1875. So that's kind of curious. So this is formerly Paradise Alley, named changed to Moscow, which means to drown in Sanskrit. Curious? Huh. There's also the Troy Highway. Huh. Troy, as in the lo formerly lost mythical city of Troy. I mean, this is all quite weird. This is all quite weird. It says here, historians have disputed the precise origin of the name Moscow. There is no conclusive proof that it is connected to the Russian capital, although various accounts suggest it purposely evoked the Russian city or was named by Russian immigrants. Another account claims the name derives from a Native American tribe named Masco. Huh, that's, in that's interesting. Wow, and here's a third theory. Early settlers reported that five local men met to choose a proper name for the town but could not agree. The postmaster, Samuel Neff, then completed the official papers for the town and chose Moscow for the name. Neff was born in Moscow, Pennsylvania. So the founder, or the guy, the postmaster who founded the name is also from Pennsylvania, from Moscow, Pennsylvania, which is where Koberger is from. I mean, wow. I mean, it's not like there aren't any other states out there. I mean, Pennsylvania and Idaho aren't the only two states. I mean, this is bonkers. This is really weird. Hmm. This is pretty weird. Moscow, Pennsylvania, population 2,000. So Moscow was literally nothing. And Moscow was settled in the 1830s, said to be named for the Russian city by early settlers who may have been Prussian Lutherans. 
Well, that makes a little bit more sense. So that's the Pocono area, which is where Coburger is from. Okay. Yeah, this is really weird. So, his parents live in Albuquerque. Wrightsville, Pennsylvania. Which is only 37 miles from Moscow, Pennsylvania. So it is very close. I mean, it's almost a stone's throw. Moscow... Pennsylvania is a stone's throw from Coburger's hometown, where, where his parents live. That's weird. That's pretty weird. Is that all? Is, is this, I mean, is this all coincidental? I mean, I don't know. This is really crazy. University of Idaho was chartered in January 1889. First opened its doors to students October 1892. Hmm. Wow. Interesting, no doubt. Okay, so... Apparently, Emma Bailey is just letting go. I mean, I don't know. This None of this really makes any sense here. Does this make any sense to anybody else? Let's go to Reddit for some, uh, for some theories. People in the know, of course, here. So, there's also a theory here that... So there's a few different theories. Some allege Emma Bailey was actually the DoorDash driver that night. I haven't seen verification of that. Anybody in the chat know anything about that? Yes, Bailey is confusing. Some people believe she was just a local drug dealer. Others believe she was actually the DoorDash driver that night and also a drug dealer. And drug deliveries were also delivered with DoorDash orders. I mean, this is one of the biggest theories being discussed on Reddit. So, the plot's going to thicken because historical ad 3356 posted this on Brian Koberger Moscow subreddit. where this individual is claiming that Emma Bailey might be the best friend of A.C., the sixth roommate, who may have been best buddies with Madison until some kind of falling out. Again, this is all speculation. I do not claim anything is true or untrue. I'm going to read this post here from 11 months ago. Two people have been arrested, so I just read that. Okay, Caden Young, a junior from Boise, had died while away from Moscow. On Tuesday, the Centralia Police Department announced the 22-year-old male was found deceased. Two people arrested in connection to his death. His official cause of death still undetermined pending a toxicology report. Okay, a preliminary investigation revealed information that illegal drug use was involved in the cause of death. 
Evidence led police to identify two people who were allegedly involved in providing illegal drugs to Young. Police arrested 22-year-old Emma Bailey and 36-year-old Demetrius Robinson. Emma Bailey of Moscow, Demetrius of Tacoma. Bailey and Robinson are accused of delivering cocaine to the victim before he overdosed at a party in Seattle the night before he died. So apparently he was discharged from the hospital, so it's kind of unknown what's going on here. It appears police suspect fentanyl was involved. The poisonous effects of fentanyl are killing individuals and devastating families, the news report states. With the recent amounts of deadly fentanyl that have been seized in our area, the Centralia Police Department and Joint Narcotics Enforcement Team have made it a priority to not only reduce the manufacturing, distribution, and transporting illegal drugs and guns within our community, but to also identify and arrest all subjects who were involved in the delivery of illegal deadly drugs like fentanyl. According to the UI, Young was majoring in journalism in the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences. He was also a past president of the Alpha Kappa Lambda fraternity. So not only was he a member, he was a former president of a frat. So the frat connections just do not cease. They simply do not cease. Huh. This is weird. Megan is saying, I was under the impression Emma Bailey was trafficked by that guy, her boyfriend slash supplier. That would, yeah, that would be unfortunate if that were true. And that's also a sad reality that, yeah, I mean, people that are supposed to be caring for their significant other or boyfriend and girlfriend are actually trafficking them. I mean, that's low. I mean, even for criminal scum, that's, that's low. Other people are also speculating what this 22-year-old is doing hanging out with the 36-year-old. So this Demetrius Johnson apparently has a long criminal history. Misdemeanor fourth degree assault, harassment. He assaulted a woman inside a hotel on the Washington State University campus. Wow, he's also got other felony assaults, trials going back all the way to 2018. Found guilty of assaulting an individual at a Pullman apartment complex in July of that same year. Robinson was also arrested by Pullman police last summer for allegedly raping a woman inside a local residence. So last summer would have been 2020. So this career criminal is just apparently getting away with everything all the time. I mean, is he connected to corrupt cops and that's why he keeps getting let out? Like, they apparently, both of them just got let out again. What is going on here? This is really weird. Significant Table posted this. Interesting that even with all of his other violent priors, that he got a felony assault and threat to kill with a quarter million dollar bond dropped down to misdemeanor fourth degree assault and harassment and ended up with a $1,500 fine and one year unsupervised probation, WTF. I smell a rat. Roll on anyone to save his own ass. That judge ought to be reprimanded for being a pansy. Hope no one he cares about gets on the bad side of douchebag oops, I mean Demetrius. Wait till he kills someone, I guess. I mean, if he hasn't already. 
That's too bad because clearly his way of handling things is physically attack, choke, cold prisoner, kick punch, and let's not forget the drugs and tendency to rape. He got five driving while suspended misdemeanors in 2015. In February, he got another driving while suspended and driving without a valid ID. He didn't show up for court, and there is an arrest warrant out for him in that case. Also interesting, his bond was only $100,000 for this latest drug charge that resulted in death. Seems weird, considering the previous bond of a quarter million dollars. Yeah, this is insane. This is wild. Apparently, he also made a post the day after the, the, the Idaho 4 murders. He said his recent actions are of those no lesser man could have accomplished. And he did it because others could not be trusted and threatened to destroy the fruits of his labors. The university is running this murder case. They need a unicorn, not a violent drug thug. Enrollment would plummet. Huh. This is really weird how their case is just dismissed. Hmm. I mean, none of this really makes any sense, does it? So apparently she dropped drugs while under surveillance on the CCTV at the police station. Remote Farm posted, had they checked her texts for November 13th, they would have probably solved the murders and shut down her drug customer's base. Huh. Also, apparently she lived and or lives right behind 1122 King Road, or formerly lived there. So there is a video of her, Pippalon Freckings Freckles posted this. I slowed down, because she got arrested for DUI. I slowed down the DUI arrest and she literally leaves drugs in the room in the chair when the cops allow her to speak to her lawyer uncuffed. She grabs a tissue, digs in her pants at the end of the room vid, and drops it on the floor. When she leaves the room, the once clear seat has a white roll on it. The next cop takes the dude in. Wonder if she even saw it or if this is a way to sneak drugs into the jail. Huh. Wow. Huh. So, wow. I mean, that would be totally wild. What is going on in Moscow, Idaho? Huh. Very, very weird. Very, very weird. Sad Zombie posted this. I don't know if he knows these people, but he posted, Emma would never do opioids. Yes, she has partied a lot in her life, but would never touch a downer. She is highly against downers, to the point where if you do them, she will not be around you. Same with Demetrius. He has lost way too many loved ones to the opioid crisis. It's a sad situation, but what does her DUI a month before her arrest have to do with this court trial? 
I mean, I don't know if this person knows them personally or what's going on. Amber Waves posted, Based on the map, I would say her house is right by where the white car was seen in the background of one of the videos that was going around. Remember, 1122 King is situated in a bowl and everything around it is elevated above. So from the house off of Walenta, you could look down through the trees and see 1122 King. A lot of comments deleted in a lot of these threads as well. I'm not sure what they were posting. Historical ad said, My source confirmed that they were very close friends regarding Emma Bailey and the sixth roommate, AC. Trashy Witty responded, There is a photo with her and Dylan out there. Huh. Roses, red, violet, blue posted, Dylan was out partying the next night, drunk AF, high AF, and laughing, as if four people didn't just get butchered in the house. Huh. I mean, I don't know what to make of that. Apparently, a lot of these kids were out partying the very next day and throughout the next week and the next month, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is that their way to cope? I mean, I don't know. Again, I'm not judging anybody for anything. It just seems kind of weird. Historical ad also posted, Drugs have ruined so many lives. Miss Bailey was once a talented marketing major, per what I've looked up. Most that use regularly will start dealing to support their habit. The Moscow Pullman area has a huge drug trafficking problem. I live in a town with a major university, and of course there's plenty of fentanyl we hear about, but mostly users hear very little about the dealers. All pretty much small time. The active felony warrants in Lata County, mostly drug trafficking, and there are many. Wow. Roses, red, violets, blue with a shocking post here. Again... I do not claim anything is true or untrue. I do not claim anyone is innocent or guilty of anything. I'm just reading these posts here. These are theories. We go over many ex mutually exclusive theories. But this one's a doozy. Emma was an escort under Idaho Moscow Escorts Massage on Backpage. She got all the girls started with OnlyFans and seeking arrangements. Xana is the only one who did not participate in this activity. There is going to be huge big deal around Kaylee financial bills and history. Lots of unexplained money deposited and purchase of a car and two loans out to rapid loan places. Thousands of dollars. This is how she really purchased her new vehicle. The drug pushers were livid that Kaylee was leaving as she wasn't doing what she was in the house to do, sell narcotics, no rent. Kaylee spoke to a police department two weeks prior out of state to snitch. 
she received something in the mail that Dylan saw. And Dylan told Quinn, who then told Emma, and so on. No one knows yet what this letter had, but it wasn't good and was something Kaylee should not have done. Dylan was in charge to make her stay that night, which she indeed did. Not sure if Maddie flushed, flushed drugs or not, but in that last week, tensions were on an all-time high in that house. Kaylee's purchase of a brand new car had everyone a little annoyed, jealousy question mark, or just annoyed she made such a flashy and obvious purchase. Brian serves a huge part in all this ironically not the murderer, though. There are rumors the reason why the prosecution isn't giving any of them the evidence and lying and acting the way they'd been acting because they needed to make a quick arrest to get the next semester registrations and get Kaylee's dad to stop digging and demanding answers, so it's rumored they are intentionally throwing this case away so BK can walk. I don't know how much I believe that question mark. But I will say the PCA is so bad and it's so obvious that they are framing him by writing things such as the sheath was placed. I mean, that's crazy. Maybe it was done on purpose and BK is indeed playing a role, question mark. I want to add that the corner club, the owner is very good friends with Chief Fry. I'll just say something very sketchy with that place, the owner and the chief of police. I wish someone would investigate these folks. They are as corrupt as it gets. Another rumor here in town was that BK got into the police department cloud files. A lot of talk about that. He found something he definitely wasn't supposed to find or even have access to. A lot of people said that Kaylee actually went to Brian since Brian was indeed under surveillance the house, but not to stock. There was going to be a raid on that house the very next week, and Brian Koberger was helping to bust that house. A lot of informants. I want to add that the cops said they did 500 interviews of students around the area. Who? Because we all never been questioned nothing. If anything, police don't want to hear anyone's tips about this case. I lived directly next to the King Road house. Never were questioned nothing. They ripped everyone's cameras. They for sure didn't want to view the anyone to view the ring footage that night, it seems. There is something on that flash drive Anne went to get from Koberger's house. Hold on, folks. This is going to be a bumpy ride. When the truth gets out, OMG, I don't know if people are going to be able to handle it. Sheesh. Okay. So apparently this post is by a student who lived right next to the house. Who was never interviewed. And apparently nobody they knew were interviewed either. <sighs> wow. Wow. I mean, that's one of the most shocking posts. Right? So is, if Koberger is connected to the case, because apparently he was working with some kind of police or cloud-based files. Now, if Kaylee was going to snitch, is that why she was so scared to come back? But why would she come back? I still don't get it. Unless she was pressured to maybe by Madison or someone who, who told her to, or if Dylan or one of the other roommates was involved with something. And they were trying to get her back there to be punished in whatever way, possibly not knowing that it would be murder, but whatever. I mean, this is all crazy, but I mean, these kinds of th the the reason conspiracy theories get out there is because they explain things better than the official narrative. So even if they're not true, it's hard to argue that they check a lot more of the boxes than the so-called official narrative. I mean, it would kind of make a lot of sense. And then, of course, just the long amount of time... The long amount of time... 
that transpired before the police at least officially arrived. So, and again, people are just constantly saying that Emma Bailey was the DoorDash delivery person to that house at the time of the murder at approximately 4 a.m. So what does everybody make of all this? If Emma Bailey really was the DoorDash driver, and she just so happens to live right behind that house as well, I mean, what, is, what does everybody make of that? I mean, that's a lot of coincidences. And she was possibly best friends with a roommate who didn't live there but still paid rent there, and possibly also close friends with Madison at some point in time. I mean, the coincidence stack here is stratospheric. I'm going to go over another shocking post here. Stuff about drugs. 1122 King Road was going around before November 13th, 2022. So here are posts... Hmm... I mean, these are posts with all the usernames kind of blocked out. My partner lives right next to where everything happened, and I was there last night. We saw parties going on there. Lots of police and reporters heard of four people being dead around 1.45 p.m. and have been hearing stuff about drugs recently, but nothing else confirmed. So this was li this post was literally within hours before anything was official. Idaho Tribune posted the section of Moscow, Idaho, where four University of Idaho students were murdered earlier this month is a known party spot, says local taxi driver who added that, quote, that's where people go to get drugs. So this is right on IdahoTribune.org. Huh. So apparently immediately it was, it was a known party spot where people go to get drugs. So are we to believe that this is all coincidental? I mean, that's a big ask. That's a big ask. So this post here from Basic Tumbleweed, a neighbor, not Inan, made this comment in the Moscow, Idaho subreddit within a few hours of the murders being discovered before the dedicated subreddits existed. She said, we've been hearing stuff about drugs recently, nothing else confirmed. I will be surprised if drugs didn't play some role in this, regardless if BK or BK plus others or some unknown person or persons did this. There are just so many red flags. The attack being labeled as targeted right away, the public being told they were not in danger, the neighbor had recently heard about the house being involved with drugs, the local taxi Uber driver said it was a drug house, Another student's mother said drugs were being sold there. Multiple parents of victims' involvement in drugs, both with arrests before and after 11-13-22. No apparent motive. 
The incel theory is weak in my opinion. It's an uncommon motive in non-sexual violent crime. Drugs are far more common, occurring literally every day. That's a good point. Kaylee hastily moving out weeks before graduating. BK's drug history. His DNA got there somehow, so in my opinion, he has some connection to that house somehow. A couple of things to add. I don't buy the Emma theory. So here's another post from Clean Tradition on Brian Koberger subreddit. EB theories support or debunk. Anyone else seeing the EB equals DoorDash driver theories in Idaho 4? Just me. For those who don't know, a young University of Idaho student passed from an OD in Seattle and they've arrested Emma Bailey, a 22-year-old Moscow resident, and DR 30-something-year-old Tacoma man for supplying the drugs. There's rumors that EB is friends with a girl who is the sixth roommate on the lease, but never moved in or moved out early or whatever. There are missing pieces, obviously, like how BK would fit into the picture, but the, with the rumors of his past drug use, plus the early morning hours he kept, similar to these arrested folks, make me wonder more and more if this was drug-related. The other missing piece would be how the residents of King Road fit into this, but there are rumors there, too, like needing time before calling the police to cover up drug-related activities, drug use sales in the house, informant status of the residents, etc. All in all, at the very least, it seems that if this man or whoever is behind or with him is supplying drugs to college kids, and drugs are clearly an issue in Moscow and likely all college towns, I went to a party school, I've seen it firsthand, but I can't help but think... This is more than just a coincidence. One of the theories in particular is interesting. I can't find anything that confirms that Zana placed the DoorDash order, just that she received a DoorDash order. So maybe someone else placed it to gain access? Question mark, maybe I'm reaching. There's also the Kim interviews. Even I admit she sounded a bit out there in her interviews, but maybe there's some truth to them, particularly her comments about drugs and the Greek system in Moscow and Pullman. Either way, it seems odd that the rumored DoorDash driver from that night had nothing to do with it, knowingly or not, but, there was, shortly, but was shortly there before the murder, had loose ties to the home, is arrested for drug-related charges months later, etc., well, not to mention she might have lived directly behind the house. This is also maybe a reach, but maybe late night DoorDash orders are their normal means of supplying or ordering drugs. Gives a solid alibi if they're pulled over late at night, early morning hours, I'm delivering a DoorDash order to drunk college kids. There's a post on Emma Bailey's TikTok, November 26th. A day after they broadcast the Elantra info from Demetrius saying, quote, I need to talk to you, check your model page, end quote, on a post that's nine months old. Perhaps he didn't want to contact her in a more direct way because the cops were getting closer. At the same time, if Emma Bailey had any involvement in the case, I have to believe she wouldn't be roaming freely, but maybe she's the one acting as an informant. I don't know, I'm down the rabbit hole. Yeah, that's, that's pretty crazy. I am also the walrus posted Moscow local here. I don't know about all that, but I have no problem believing drugs were involved. That entire area is a mess in that regard. That was actually my first theory. Drug deal gone wrong. More specifically, there were even rumors of stolen fentanyl pills. There's definitely way more to this than we're being told. 
Once I heard about his past drug issues, it crossed my mind that BK could have been selling and or buying, which defense could use to explain why he was in the area as much as he was. It's a notoriously trappy neighborhood. Law enforcement in small towns like this are usually corrupt on some level. Everyone knows each other. I know for a fact some sexual assault and drug-related expletive has been covered up. And there have been a handful of sus suicides here and in Pullman. That doesn't necessarily mean they have the wrong guy in this case or that anyone's being framed. Remember, the majority of this investigation can be credited to the FBI and ISP. And I definitely believe BK's involved, but I've had doubts for a while he is the only one involved. ETA, the altercation that supposedly went down at the frat house prior to the murders was always an interesting detail, and I'd be surprised if it didn't tie in somehow. Yeah, that's another one to add to the, co the coincidence stack. I mean, yeah, that's insane. I mean, that's kind of a, this is like True Crime 101. Did you have an argument or, or altercation with anyone, with any of the victims? I mean, that's, this is true crime 101. Financial Armadillo posted this. My niece is at WSU, but she has friends at school in Moscow, and one is in a sorority. They were all told to make their socials private and not discuss the case with anyone, nor share any details about the deceased. But she thought it was more out of safety concerns. The general theory around WSU is that BK was stalking at least one of them, and out of respect for the victims and survivors. There is definitely a rumor about a fight at the frat house that night. She has also heard the rumors that the roommates delayed calling police because there were drugs in the house. My niece said that sorority and fraternity members' recreational use of drugs is not uncommon, nor a secret, but it seems more out in the open at Moscow than in Pullman. Cannabis is legal in Washington, but not in Idaho. Obviously, you can just drive over the border, buy weed, and drive back to campus if you live in Moscow. When I first heard the roommates called friends, I figured they couldn't believe what they were seeing and that their 20-year-old brains freaked out and thought, oh no, cops will be coming, we have drugs in here. We don't know if it could be something like cocaine or opioids or more run-of-the-mill, oh no, hide my bong before the cops come over because you're not thinking straight, we'll see. Hmm. Yeah, I mean... Like there, there's a never list. There's a never-ending list of oddities here. New Woofers posted, shouldn't there be video of the DoorDasher's car and pings from the DoorDasher's cell phone as well? Clean to Tradition responded, definitely. They've known who the DoorDash driver is, but there's rumors that it's her. They could definitely be wrong, but it seems weird if she truly narrowly missed a massacre, knows and has ties to the residents, and is a drug dealer while there are rumors this was drug-related. Just rumors, I get it, but it seems like a lot is going on in the area, and the girl has been involved, potentially, with two major incidents. If she's not the DoorDash driver, then my theory goes out the window.
apparently there was a leaked audio from the Jack in the Box employee saying that the DoorDash driver was Emma Bailey. So I'm, I'm guessing that's where it comes from, and until that audio is authenticated, I guess we don't know. Also, let's not forget when B BK's first question was, was anyone else arrested? Which is a curious question. Yeah, wow, well, this, this is all really, really mind-shocking, because there's still no confirmation on any of this, obviously. Okay, couple more things to go over here. This is... I don't know the source here. Is this... Reddit or somewhere else. I have it on good authority. Cousin is a cop in a nearby town, but called in to help in Moscow when school started back up. Apparently, the investigation is looking directly at the Sigma Chai frat party. Ethan and Xana attended from 8 to 9 that night. He did not have any update on their timeline after they left 9 to 145 but did say it looks like the investigation is honing in on two suspects from the party that night, and an update should publicly name them by the end of the week. There's no date on this post. Sigma has made their socials private and removed all info from Facebook going back a few years. That's curious. They believe Ethan and Xana were the main targets, stemming from an argument that night. Downstairs survivors could hear two males rummaging through the room above them, figured it was an after-party, locked the doors, and went to bed. When they discovered them in the morning, about 30 minutes before the 911 call, they called their friends at Sigma to come over, who in turn called the police. It's right across the street, and for whatever reason, they believed it was people from Sigma upstairs around 2.15 that night. The back door was left open, one dead in bed, the other blocking their room's door with their body. Police just updated their Facebook to reiterate they are not looking into the activities of that night, only the murders, which to me suggests something went on fight, drugs, etc., and spilled into anger later that night and got them killed. Also didn't want to release profile they created as it would cause undue fear in the community, i.e. Greek life. So this is a post supposedly by someone whose cousin is in a cop in a nearby town but was called to Moscow after school started back up. So, according to this individual, the surviving roommates heard two males who, for whatever reason, they believe to be from Sigma at 2.15 a.m. 
And apparently, this is the same frat that they call the morning of after the bodies are discovered. Does that seem weird to anybody if this info is legit? I mean, this is kind of weird. If this info is legit, does this seem more like a setup than anything else? Again, I am not claiming it is legit, but if it is, what does that mean? Also, apparently there's a cry, please someone help, on the Linda Lane footage at 2.11 a.m. Again, I am not sure if that was legitimate or not. See, if it was legitimate and they were seeking to cover it all up, would they have someone admit it wasn't legitimate, even if it was? Just classic plausible deniability from the playbook. Because it fools the gullible goofs every time. As soon as someone admits to doctoring something, or something is claimed to have been doctored, they can just say, oh yeah, that was doctored, you can disregard that. But if it was true all along, what does that mean? Because if they're trying to cover up the timeline for whatever reason, what does that mean? Apparently there's the Linda Lane car park footage, and there are... There are several one-hour-long videos, and apparently you can hear someone crying, please, someone help, at 2.11 a.m. Newt Revolutionary posted, this one sounds the most plausible, honestly. M and K walked in on it and were killed, too. The cops were closing in. School bigwigs and maybe rich parents found out put pressure on the cops to change direction in their investigation. School doesn't want Greek life to look bad, bad publicity, parents may be big donors, etc. They change the timeline to give the real suspects alibis and just throw everything off in general, and BK is the fall guy. I had heard recently that BK was known to brag that he was smarter than criminals, murderers, and that he could catch anyone with his new way to catch criminals. Someone may have wanted to frame him in particular because of that. This shows premeditation, though, so if the first thing is true, maybe someone was harboring a grudge for a while. The frat fight was their opportunity. Huh. That's weird. That's pretty weird. So is it possible that Madison and Kaylee may have been involved in some kind of drug dealing, but that wasn't the reason for this quadruple homicide? Again, let's not fall for false dichotomy logical fallacies. If this really stemmed from some kind of frat, fight, uh, frat party fight, I mean, I don't know. I mean, obviously more than one thing can be true. So something definitely led the police to think that this was a targeted attack right away and that there was no danger to the community. So what information did they have for that? Uh, 
There was also an interview November 25th with Idaho State Police spokesman Aaron Snell, and someone asked him if anything was written on the walls in the home. He said he wasn't going to answer that. Huh. Here's a post on, so apparently Veritas Aquitas on this YouTube channel claiming that AC, the sixth roommate, reported their Idaho 4 video. And there's a comment here by NHIV386, they were there at the grub truck that night. AC, her brother, her BFF Emma, plus others. They drive a high-dollar black Jeep SUV. Sometime after 4.30 a.m., a male who's in a hurry jumps into the black SUV and is seen quickly pulling out of the parking spot at the Queen Apartments, wow, Queen, King, Queen, wow, this is crazy, at the Queen Apartments in the Linda Lane 4 to 5 a.m. video. Then is seen leaving on Taylor Road, passing by the Linda Lane entrance one minute after leaving the parking spot. Did he stop to pick up the rest of them at 1122 King Road because it only takes 10 seconds or so to get to Linda Lane? Huh. Again, this is all just rumor speculation, but apparently people are claiming here that AC was dating one of the Jacks after all this happened. Huh. This user also, okay, is claiming, wow. I mean, these are some really wild claims and accusations from N8IV386, possibly the most mind-shocking in the entire case. So... My opinion, she AC planned to be with the victim victim's longtime ex Jack and her own brother and his sicko buds savagely killed them while it was being live streamed. In my opinion, this is all about the pledging of allegiance to the Greek sorority and codes of the past, present, and current Greeks and their cover-up for the six Greeks who are responsible for the quadruple homicide. BK wasn't one of them. 
had nothing to do with the murders and is being framed. K and M were killed in retaliation for the bullying and subsequent suicide of Hannah Clear, a former roommate at 1122 and an informant, and E and X were killed in retaliation for the teasing of a gay fraternity brother they walked in on. I believe that DM, BF not sure, may have been drugged to sleep through, but DM was aware because those who did this at 11.22 were at 11.22 before and well after doing staging and other things. What? Wait, what? Okay, th this is absolutely insane if this is true. Mrs. John posted, Yup, heard about the live streaming. The grub truck guy and others all watching their phones. Grub truck dude said people are dying tonight. I think it was Ethan and Zana they were watching. They left the frat house at 9 p.m. Zana's dad said they were at home after 9 p.m. in bed watching TV. Don't know if he talked to her or if it was a text. Then Maddie and Kaylee walked in on it. That's why Black Jacket was found by Fire Hydrant? Question mark. Someone told me Maddie stole that jacket. I don't know any of these people, but I do respond to things that interest me on this case. Wait a second. So, is there a claim that the murders were live streamed and that you can hear people in the grub truck video talking about people dying? Does anybody have the full grub truck video? I mean, when does the grub truck close? So what does everybody make of all this? I mean, this is getting to be quite the tangled web. I mean, we do have to keep in mind, this is the post-internet age. So, I mean, this is the live streaming age. I mean, obviously there have been other cases where people have live streamed a murder, but not exactly like this. This would be really sick. And if people did do this, obviously, I mean, wouldn't you think... If that many people had the link or whatever, I mean, wouldn't you think it would be more well-known? I mean, I don't know. I mean, especially involving drunk college kids. I mean, I don't know. If that were true, wouldn't that be more well-known? But those are the theories for now. I mean, that's... uh that's what we have for now. Obviously, I will continue to cover this case and all these other cases until they're definitively solved. But there's just there's just so much here, and it's just really, really creepy. I mean, it's definitely creepy. And, I mean, going back to, you know, Skull and Bones and some of these other secretive fraternities where there have been rumors that they've killed people as initiations and all that, going back, I mean, over a century now, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's also very, very dark, of course, but, uh, yeah, we will pick this up in the next episode, if you found this edition of Mind Shock True Crime interesting and informative, you want to help keep up awareness in unsolved cases, cold cases, missing persons cases, wrongful convictions, and more, you can donate to our PayPal, just check the link in the description, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, you can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube, help support the channel that way, like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon, Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, cool podcast, or requests, you can also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier, questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, Leave them in the comments section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys 
next time.